yeah we did that before you came so good evening everybody welcome to dhamma sukha so one of the meanings of dhamma is the truth and sukha means happiness so may you experience the happiness of truth this retreat so that said it's also july 4th happy 4th everyone uh, airports must have been busy today and it may take not busy good but you must be a little tired getting here it's long travels and uh, that is the case i came here yesterday so i it was heavy rain and nice nice welcome but thunder did you see the rainbow <laughs> no rainbow <laughs> so expect a rainbow at some point and expect fireworks too real firework is the firework in your mind <laughs> so don't expect that <laughs> because that is building unexpected uh goals um the reality you know, we need, we all need to ground in reality um when there is a gap between reality and expectations we suffer we don't need that um but i hear there will be some fireworks coming at the end of the retreat and that is not based on your performance you will have it anyway <laughs> um but before we give instructions i we want you to let go of old habitual ways of practicing unless you were practicing the twim practice which is what we do here and um, habitual ways you know i remember practicing meditation and my mind always goes to old habitual ways of meditating there is a thing like that it it does that um there's a little story that i like to share this is of uh, from the zen tradition um you know there is this professor who knew so much of about meditation um he went to a zen monk and asked for teachings and this monk gave the teachings but the professor was so skeptical um no matter how many techniques he was taught he wasn't getting it um he was asking too many questions and was not willing to practice so that is like unsatisfied and unsatisfied mind so this monk decided to change his way of teaching um he decided to make some tea and he brought two cups and he was pouring tea into those cups and it overflowed and the professor saw it and said stop there is no room and the monk said exactly there is no room in your mind you have learned so much it's time for you to let go of those old habitual ways and really sincerely commit to one uh, twim practice there's yeah, so this connects with uh, another story this is from the time of the buddha there was a monk named potila um he knew many suttas he had many students so he was teaching the suttas to those many students and he was famous but he never practiced any meditation one time he went to see the buddha and the buddha addressed him as empty headed potila <laughs> and the monk was not upset he knew that the buddha was compassionately giving him a message so that moment he abandoned all his monastery teachings and fame and went to a very remote area where there was 
a group of monks practicing meditation and they were very sincerely practicing the Buddha's teachings. But this Portilla monk was famous and when he asked for teachings from those monks, they said, you know so much, just use one of those teachings and practice. But this monk, he had, you know, too much, he just didn't know where to begin. And ultimately he, he ended up going to a novice monk, a Samanera. And this novice monk, very young one, was willing to teach him. He asked, are you willing to do anything I tell you to do? And the Venerable Portilla said, yes. So if so, walk into that muddied pond, walk into the middle of it. This is like coming to the middle ground, letting go of any extremes you are in. And he did that with all his pristine looking robes. And now the teachings began. The novice monk said, this is your actual teaching. Suppose there is an ant hill with six holes in it. And there is a lizard enters into it. And how do you catch the lizard? And Venerable Portilla learned that, okay, this is how the teachings come. Okay, you close five holes and you observe from one. The holes you close are there with you. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, physical sensations. But the mind, it's not easy to close it. And I'll tell you more about it. But with these practices, with this teaching, Venerable Portilla used his teachings, the knowledge he had, and became an arahant, that means an enlightened monk, so quickly. And the Buddha never called him empty-headed Portilla again. So mind is that door that is open. That is how you catch the lizard. Mind is like a lotus in the muddied pond. It opens layer by layer and in this lotus there are these dirty petals in outer layers. And when it opens with the light of wisdom, it has fragrance, beauty and something delicate about it. And this is the nature of our mind. When the Buddha became enlightened, he said, I'm like a lotus. I'm not like these ordinary beings who don't have that purity in their minds. So he emerged from the mud of defilements and he never went back to those old ways. So to taste the happiness of Dhamma is very rare. So this Venerable Bhante Vimalaransi, um, you can look at his happy smiling face. Um, that will be a message for all of us to smile more and more. He always emphasized that. It was difficult for him to taste the true teachings because of his, the kind of practice he was introduced to. It didn't work for him. He saw his mind was getting frustrated and teachings that he knew didn't work for him. And he was reading commentaries, commentaries written to the original discourses of the Buddha. These are called Attakathas. It didn't help him so much. So one of the Sri Lankan monks, Venerable Purnaji, who lived in Malaysia at the time, told him to let go of the suttas and go to the, into the discourses, original authentic teachings of the Buddha. And he did that. And he learned that the Buddha taught Samatha, Vipassana, Bhavana and Prajna. And he began discovering the taste, true taste of Dhamma when he began to practice this according to the teachings of the Buddha. 
He had many invitations to teach, but he said, nope, I have bigger work to do. He went into a cave in Malaysia and shared the cave with the cobra in Thailand and shared the cave with the cobra and began his practice, share, occasionally sharing food with this cobra. And he got the practice, he saw it working. He learned loving kindness practice and he learned that the Buddha taught it more than any other teachings he did, more than the Anapanasati breathing meditation. I even countered it with him once because I kind of had the spirit of wanting to challenge him when I was learning from him. <laughs> um, and he was right. So he learned the relaxing technique, he learned the right effort, and he saw it working for him. This was beautiful, and he had this spiritual urgency to practice, some vega to practice more and more, and also to share the teachings with others, the way it worked for him. How sincere is that? That's amazing he did. He, he sincerely put that effort to learn the practice and teach it with, uh, with us. And he established what we now call Dhammasukha Meditation Center. He passed away last year. He ordained Sister Kema and he ordained many monks. He invited David and invited Christian to be part of this mission and now they teach the exact teachings that he, he taught all over the world. And I had the fortunate karma to travel with him to Indonesia, to Sri Lanka and translate for him. Translating is easy but actual teaching I learned it's, it's not easy. He did some revolutionary work. So now let go of old ways and sincerely come to this practice. That is what I wanted to <coughs> tell you first. This retreat is going to be a Brahma Vihara retreat. Brahma means divine, Vihara is abode. Divine abode, you live like a Deva divine person in this retreat. You have such good conditions here. Um, you know one time <coughs> Venerable Anand, the Buddha's attendant monk, went to the Buddha and said, I know 50% of practice depends on friendship. The Buddha said, Mahevang Anand, don't say that Anand, don't say that. 100% of the practice depends on the spiritual friendship. One hundred. This is in Upadda Sutta. So you have that here. You have teachers and companions and those who have done the twin practice and teachings. You have the books. So the first sublime state, Brahma Viharas are also called sublime states, sublime. Your mind goes, enters into sublime levels through this practice. And the first one is loving kindness. It is one way to quickly tranquilize the mind. So Bhante Vimala Ransi introduced tranquility into this practice. And then he introduced wisdom into this practice, just like the Buddha did. And he introduced insight into this practice. And he introduced meditation, bhavana, cult development of the mind into this practice. That is now called twim practice. In it, we do loving kindness. So what is loving kindness? Loving kindness means sincere concern for the well-being and happiness of oneself and others. If it does not include you, it is incomplete. It's like pouring from an empty cup. So it's, it must include you first. And you can bring up this warm, loving feeling to your heart 
and most people practice with some statements may I be well may I be happy may I be peaceful may I be calm may I be uh, may no harm come to me may good things happen to me may the influence of malignant beings does not affect me may I only be guided by friends who have sincere intentions so you cultivate you just bring up this feeling and also the corresponding thoughts into the practice don't be afraid of these thoughts because these are wholesome thoughts not unwholesome thoughts <coughs> like David and I discussed yesterday this loving kindness takes you all the way to abandon anger and frustration that means you become you never return to these habitual ways of anger it is a practice you know, when a kettle is boiling you can't undo it it's boiling so the gradual practice takes you to completely make you free from anger how amazing is it to to be free from anger to live around people who don't have anger that is what this practice do and loving kindness one of the 11 benefits this is in anguttara nikaya one of the 11 benefits of practicing loving kindness is your mind concentrates quickly you want to know the other 10 you sleep well you wake up happy and you won't have nightmares and you won't be harmed by fire weapons and poison and you become beautiful your face becomes serene you don't need makeup you have it free from loving kindness it's not exp it's inexpensive it's free and other humans like you non-humans like animals our puppies will like you they're a little skittish try to see if that skittishness change <laughs> and heavenly beings guard you protect you I've heard people you know radiating loving kindness and accidents do happen but they are not harmed there is some power like that even someone coming storming toward you wanting to like destroy you but they 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 pose they can't they, they lose that energy because of the kind of power that you have developed so your mind quickly concentrates and you if when you die you die mindfully and if you did not become enlightened your mind goes to the highest realm that is the Brahma world very pristine long time of happiness that you will experience because of the kind of practice that you did the Buddha said make it your vehicle you go everywhere with loving kindness make it your precious jewel always keep loving kindness in everything you do so loving kindness is like what mothers feel when the baby is in the womb and she doesn't know who this baby is but she protects this baby this is my baby so all the puppies you see this is my baby you want to protect them insects you see this is my baby that kind of loving kindness arises in your heart so the mother also gives birth to this baby and sees that the baby is crying now and the mother understands this message this is compassion the softening of your heart with love and kindness wanting to care for others and the mother also knows that this baby takes the first bite first step and she's happy unconditionally happy this is called mudita joy we need that we need that contentment happiness in our hearts and she knows that this child grows up and become an adult and will go on his own ways 
So she develops equanimity in her heart. So you see gradually your mind experiences these sublime states in that, you know, that's one example that you can learn a little bit about how these work. But when you practice, when you radiate loving kindness, you can also bring up um, a little baby to your mind, a baby smiling um, with, with you, sharing that smile, a little puppy to your heart, put it in that, in your chest, and start radiating loving kindness to yourself for about 15 minutes. And when you f start to feel calm and happy and loving, you know what it is like to feel that way. Now you have developed that kind of heart. You are not pouring from an empty cup. You are ready to share, radiate this loving kindness with a spiritual friend, someone you respect so much, someone you love, um, I mean, love in the sense of not romantic love, um, someone you sincerely care for, someone of not the same sex, of the same sex, right? It has to be of the, same. Of the same sex, okay? Not the opposite gender. Um, and someone who is alive, not a family member, because there's a lot going on there, you know, they say. <laughs> if you truly think you are enlightened, you go live with your family. <laughs> it's like that, so. Not a family member. And you sincerely wish happiness and well-being to this spiritual friend. Bhante used to say you can choose His Holiness the Dalai Lama if you want. But it's good if this person is someone you really, really know. Someone who has good intentions towards you. And that way you start to really develop it quickly. Um, and see this person smiling and happy in your mind, in your heart. Keep this person in your heart all the time. And then when you are done with this person, you choose another spiritual friend and up to four spiritual friends. You will hear this more um, th over the days of practicing. And after that, you are ready to accept four family members, your parents, siblings, spouse, children. Sincerely wish happiness and loving kindness, radiate loving kindness from your heart to these family members. No matter what they do, you just sincerely wish them happiness and well-being. Good thoughts. See them smiling. When you see one, you go to the next person. This may take just a little bit, only a little bit of time, maybe 15 minutes, maybe less. And now, after four family members, you pick four neutral people. The pilot that took you here, the mailman, garbage collector, the teller at the bank, the bus driver, anyone who, you know, who doesn't know you so much and you don't know about them so much, but you sincerely wish them happiness and radiate loving kindness to them. See them, visualize them smiling and happy in your mind. It doesn't matter what they do now in their lives, but in your mind, they are happy and joyful and smiling. Now, the tricky part. We all have some annoying, difficult people to deal with in life. You know, friends become enemies, they become frenemies, you know. <laughs> and you, you choose them one by one, as many enemies as you have. And you radiate loving kindness to them. Sincerely wish happiness to them. See them, visualize them smiling and happy. You can do that. It is a service you do to yourself. One after the other. It doesn't matter what they did to you. In your heart, you are not holding any grudges. You just let go 
forgive yourself. We will introduce forgiveness if you need to practice that. Please let us know. If it gets difficult to radiate loving kindness to these difficult people, you can come back to neutral people and radiate loving kindness and bring that feeling. And when you have it, you go back to the difficult ones again and sincerely wish them happiness. This is like breaking barriers. Your mind is not limited because of these individuals in your life. Now you are free. You are ready to radiate loving kindness to all beings in all directions. Beings in front of you, behind you, above, below, on your right hand side, left hand side. All these beings deserve near and far, known, not known to you. Beings in the ocean, just looking at them like your child. What can I do for them? Like your heart softens. And you experience all sublime states gradually as you, and also joy. There's this tear coming out of your eyes. You, you smile and you, you notice that your personality start to change when you practice this way. This is when you know that the Eightfold Path actually works. But like always, when you do any practice, you also get distracted. We get distracted because of lack of mindfulness, st strong craving, too many thoughts, many things. So we need to sincerely make right effort. And right effort means cultivating the wholesome that is already arisen, or what has not been arisen yet, you bring them up and cultivate more. And if anything unwholesome has been arised, arisen in your heart, you abandon them and prevent new unwholesome things from arising, okay? Sloth and torpor, hindrances, doubt, restlessness, aversion, um, sensual desire, craving, all these things arise. So Bhante saw that happening to him and happening to us all. This is the nature of the mind. So he developed something that we can remember. You can look at the, the practice there if you are new to it. It only takes two seconds to do this practice. It doesn't take too long. You don't need to even memorize it. You can see that whenever you feel distracted, when you are radiating loving kindness, and you are no longer with the object of meditation, you are distracted with a thought or something, or a sensation, you recognize it. Mindfully recognize it. And next, release it from your attention. And next, you relax any tension, any tightness, this thought, this sensation brought to you, to your brain, to your heart, to your chest. Anywhere you felt any, sen any tension, any tightness, you relax. This is very, very important. You will find when I teach on day four, the relaxed step is right there in the Buddha's teachings. This is called Pasambhati in Pali. Pasambhayang, that's the word. Anyway, and then you quickly bring up something wholesome, like I said. What is really easy to do is to bring up a smile. These corners in your mouth, mouth like Sister Kema used to say, is there for you to smile. If you cry, they go down. So smile more and more. Always smile. Bhante used to look at the dining room and ask, are you smiling? So <laughs> it kind of shakes the room and everybody starts smiling. So it's always important to bring that wholesome smile in your face, in your heart, in your mind. So you need to be mindful of that. When Bhante used to always emphasize and teach his interpretation of mindfulness. So what is mindfulness? Remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. This is all you need to, like the, in Agni Sutta you will learn that mindfulness is needed everywhere in these practices. 
You know the story of um, Thich Hans closing the door story? Do you know? This is a story of mindfulness. So when he was a very little novice monk, his teacher asked him to do something. He got excited. He slammed the door behind him. And the teacher called him and said, my dear child, come back. Now close the door again. So this time, with full of his presence, he closed that door. And his teacher never had to remind him again of how to close the door. And Thich Nhat Hanh became a big monk, established Plum Village in France. And he was visiting Connecticut. There was a Trappist monastery of where Thomas Merton lived. There he shared the story with Thomas Merton and Thomas Merton said, I noticed that. I saw how, how much presence you give to this one activity of closing the door. I saw that before even you tell me this story. <coughs> and so Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh went back to Plum Village and Thomas Merton shared this story with his students. And there was a Catholic lady in that group. She went to France, to Plum Village, to see how Thich Nhat Hanh closed the door. <laughs> it's so, so important to learn these things. And in the practice, you see um, noises. You, know, you get frustrated how, um, how hot it, how, how humid it is. Please stay hydrated um, all the time, and uh, you get frustrated about the noises that you hear, how other people eat, how other people talk, and all these things. Talking is not allowed. We all need vitamin Q. That is called vitamin quiet <laughs> in this practice. All the time, we maintain noble silence. That means it's not only about not, you know, not talking. It's about maintaining silence in your thoughts as well, less and less thoughts. This is like Janic level of silence. So you will see that you hear these noises. And there's another story of the monk who dealt with the noises. He was bothered by noises. He decided to go into the middle of the ocean. That's the quietest place, he thought, for him to meditate. He went there. He began meditating. His mind went into some tranquility. But soon he started hearing noises. Some boat was hitting his boat. And he built a story about it in his mind. These fishermen, they, know, they don't know how important the work I do here. and They can't see me. So, so he was ready to scream. He was ready to open his eyes. And he did open his eyes only to see that it was just another empty boat. So all these noises and disturbances and thoughts are just empty boats. Let them go. The six R it. That's all. Six R takes you all the way to Nibbana. That's what Bhante used to say, and that's that is true. That's right effort. Very important part of our meditation. So tomorrow morning, um, we start with precepts. So before you go to bed tonight, maybe at 10 or so, you practice meditation with the group until 10. And then you prepare to go to bed. You make a determination. This is a good practice, aditana, paramita. It's a perfection that the Buddhas do, making a determination and fulfilling it. So um, make a determination in your mind to wake up at 5.25. Five minutes before 5.30. And also another wish that the first thing you do is to smile when you wake up. Easy, right? You can do it. And then you, you know, wash your face and come to the Dhamma Hall. And you, you get eight precepts. This includes abstaining from an evening meal. This is very good for you like moderate eating. Eat just enough. Be mindful there. The Buddha says, Mattanyutaja Bhattasming. 
be moderate in eating. That's good for you. Sani kanjiriti slows slowly it, it it digests slowly and ayupalana you live a long life because of this moderate eating um, so you will receive eight precepts and we do um, dhammapada reflections together and um, a guided meditation and after that um, you will hear you meditate with the group here and until seven you meditate and you hear the bell and you go to breakfast and I think you are assigned yogi jobs already maybe yeah so if you are not you you will be assigned them um, they will be assigned to you tomorrow morning um, so you you mindfully take quietly take your breakfast no chit chatting there is such a strong desire to ask something please ask Kristen David or myself, or Bhante Upekanand, unless you don't want any disturbances. So, and uh, these yogi jobs, you know, bring your loving kindness to the yogi jobs. I remember I was 16 when I became a monk and I did a lot of garden work and I was frustrated. I said, This is not why I became a monk. Mm -hmm. I told the monk who did that. <laughs> and uh, because I didn't know how to deal with that work, no training. This is like those Western monks going to Northeastern Thailand and they eat one meal a day and they are there to just learn the meditation and practice it. But this one time they were assigned a very difficult labor task to move a huge pile of soil from one place to another. You will not get that as a yogi job here. <laughs> Um, very simple ones. But this time the teacher assigned it and he went somewhere. So these monks worked hard uh, for three days and they did not complain. They thought we, we can just wash ourselves and do the practice. But the second monk said, that's the wrong place for the soil. Can you please move it back to this place? And they took three days, no complaints, and they, they did that. And Six days later, the teacher monk came back and said, that's the wrong place. That's not the place I told you to move the soil to. And these monks were so frustrated. They started cursing in English. <laughs> but the Thai monks understood that they are very angry. And one of the monks said, pushing the wheelbarrow is easy, but thinking about it is harder. So yogi job is really easy. Don't think too much about it. Just loving kindness. Take loving kindness with it all the time. And after that you brush or do whatever you want to do and come back to a longer sitting. Sit no less than 30 minutes in each sitting or longer. One hour, two hours, three hours please. Don't worry about your lunch. Kristen will feed you no matter what. It's not breaking precepts. If you have to sit, sit. It's your right intention to just practice. It's great. So continuously, you know, keep the smile going, keep loving kindness going, and the rest will happen. It's so easy, but don't take it too seriously. It's like the strings of a vena. You know, if you if it's too tight, you wouldn't get the right sound. If it's too loose, you wouldn't also get the right sound. So just. Make it middle path. Continue the, your practice. Um, we will learn more about hindrances. Whenever you know mind gets dull, um, switch to walking meditation and walk in a designated area, looking downward in normal pace, and uh, walk backward mindfully obviously on a leveled ground and your eyes open just normal walking and you um, I think you will start to see the blood f blood flow starts and you feel energized and you immediately come back to your chair or sitting and uh, you continue your practice so it's uninterrupted that way but you don't have to really 
change your posture, making noises all the time. Um, sometimes you cultivate patience. Patience leads to Nibbana all the time, all the way. So patience. So you let that sensation, tingling disappear. Uh, sit in a chair. You don't have to always think, you know, have an image in your mind that sitting in a chair is necessary unless you really like and you are used to it. Um, you know those monks who sit perfectly, they only do sitting. They don't do any meditation. They are just focused on the sitting posture. They quit being monks easily. But those monks who nod like this, they remain monks. They enjoy the meditation. They don't give up easily. They just flow with the, go with the flow. So it's just like that. Don't be too like, too firm on you. Like just be gentle with your sitting, not leaning forward, not leaning backward. Just straight up, um, back straight, and your sitting bones upright, um, relaxed, shoulders relaxed. You will learn more with uh, the practice guided meditation tomorrow, and I will do the first guided meditation and. Um, Bhante will do the next guided meditations and precepts uh, in the next days. But you will also get a time for an interview, um, unless it's assigned to you already. And in that, it's about 10 minutes of checking your progress, how you do and what needs to be done. And I will ask four questions. Your best sitting the longest you could stay with the object of meditation and how the longest sitting as well and uh, maybe if you had any questions or something like that. Anything else? Yeah, those things. Um, yeah. So you don't have to think about those questions that you have to report to me or anything. Um, just take a mental note, bookmark it in your mind and um, line up maybe 10, you know, just 10 minutes before. Please be on time to Dhamma Talks and um, you will receive more teachings um, as we go. Um, yeah, so I stopped at Yogi Jogs and you come here and then there's lunch and then there's evening for you to practice and there will be the Dhamma Talk and time for you to explore and that will be one time you can talk and ask questions. Make sure you, are, you just ask well thought, nice questions where you really see that um, because those, the Buddha said, those who ask questions are born wise. Um, I'm sorry about those who never ask questions. So it's important you ask questions, but do ask them. But um, make sure it's, it's it's not you know distracting everybody. Try to stick with the practice and the teachings being given. Um, yeah. So happy meditation. Anything else? Um, we will talk more about maybe craving, <laughs> craving like stuff. Craving is I like it, I don't like it mind. We will talk about that with the teachings. Um, um, let go of it, recognize it and let go, six are it. What else? Um, I had it in my mind, but then it disappeared. So, yes, those who have done this practice before, start with radiating loving kindness in all directions. You have already done breaking the barriers, and you are ready to start with that step. Um, and that's it. Yeah, and to make sure that people at the beginning just stay with the spiritual friends until Bhante tells you to change. Right. You heard that. <laughs> yeah, stay with the spiritual friend as you cultivate loving kindness from you to the spiritual friend. Um, we will adjust it as we go, but um, for now, stay with the spiritual friend after radiating loving kindness and bringing loving kindness to your heart. And stay with that spiritual friend smiling and radiating loving kindness like a lighthouse all the time. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I heard backwards, but I... Oh, normal walking too, yeah. First you walk in, in, in normal pace, not um, like too slow um, or too fast, just normal steps. Um, but keeping your spiritual friend in your heart all the time and keeping that smile going and zigzagging the distractions. And you walk for about maybe four meters, ten meters or so, and then come back. But if, it is, if you feel sleepy, you just walk backward and you just kind of wake up and re-energize yourself and come back to your sitting. Or you just walk back and forth. Walking is part of meditation and it's something the Buddha did sometimes all night. And if you want to do that all night tonight, do it. But please don't do too much. Um, you don't have to. Yeah. Good. So, happy meditation. Um, happy retreat. Um, yeah, may your minds be uplifted with Dhamma. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so Bhante used to um, have a little brain here, and um, it's, it's a plastic brain, <laughs> rubber rubber brain, brain, and he he described um, how it has this membrane and a meninge in it that has the feelings and sensations and tension and tightness is felt there if you uh, if you pay attention to uh, with every thought sometimes because they just randomly occur. And all you have to do is, you know, recognize the distraction and release it from your attention and quickly relax that tension and tightness in your head, in your brain, in your face, in the back of your head, shoulders, heart. Just maybe a deep inhale and exhale. Um, it just takes a couple of seconds. It's doable. And then you go to the re-smile stage. You don't dwell too, too, too long in relaxing stage. And return, repeat. But keep, keep, you know, if you keep your precepts closely, you will have less distractions. If you are negligent about your re re precepts, your mind will be restless very quickly. And you will have remorse arising in your heart. So, good. Any more questions? Yep. I seem to remember Bhante in some of the videos mentioning needing to tranquilize your body when you first sit down. Um, what, is, is that, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, I think you can actually um, like do a, you bring your shoulders up with a deep inhale and drop them. So you kind of feel the entire body. And, quietly if possible and and do it a couple of times and maybe quickly scan your body to make sure that you are ready to sit long and that will be useful. Bhante actually was, his teacher instructed him to sit 23 hours a day, which he did because he's him. <laughs> he, he did that. But this was not good for him. His, he developed problems later. So please be loving and kind to yourself. Um, please give that walking exercise and just the regular things you do to maintain a healthy body. But with right intentions, just to maintain this practice sincerely. Okay? Any more questions? Good. Let's share merits. Please bring your palms together and recite this together. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fields be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. 
May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You will actually get to listen to Bhante's teachings and um, also Dharmacharya Delson. He's currently uh, in Greece or else called heaven. He will maybe join us on Zoom and answer questions and have a Dharma chat with us. So um, it's important we do that. Um, he has so much wisdom to share and also Bhante has so much wisdom to share and you will love his um, teachings. So yeah, that's something I um, forgot to tell. Happy meditation and good night. <laughs>